of the need to spend personal time with the Lord. Aren't we all given 24 hours a day? Can't you devote one hour a day to praying and talking with the Lord, reading your Bible, praying, talking to Him? If you can't, if you can't focus your mind, if you're like me, write it out on, on a journal, on a tablet or something. Write out your prayer to the Lord. Isn't it worth it? I, I, I know you're probably thinking, well, you don't understand. When I'm driving to work, I pray. Or when I'm at work, I pray. Or, or when I'm dealing with situations, I pray. I, I know you do. I do that too. We pray all the time. But what about spending an hour a day it's just you and the Lord. It's you and the Lord, and you, you, you're letting Him know that this is our time. This is our personal time to read and to write and to write and to pray and to commune with God. When that happens in your life, your life will be changed from then on out. I know it will. There will be a close a closeness to God. Now you can recognize a godly man. You rather what comes out of his mouth, what he says, how he lives his life, you'll recognize it by his personal relationship with the Lord. Second, or number two on your list there, is that he will be known for building up and not tearing down. A real godly man will be known for building up and not te tearing down. Paul says in verse 8, unlike the abusive, destructive, false, uh, false apostles, Paul used his authority as an apostle of Jesus Christ for building the Corinthians up and not for destroying them. A true man of God will inevitably have a positive impact on the church as he edifies, strengthens, and matures it. He will have a positive influence. He will encourage, he will exhort, he will challenge, he will urge. The preaching of a man of God or the teaching of a man of God should be to instruct in God's Word and apply it to life. That's what a man of God will do. That's what somebody who's godly will do in their life. They will live that way purposely because their goal is to build people up. It's to build them up and not tear them down. It's to encourage. It's to exhort. It's to challenge. To, to holiness, to live a godly life. It's a challenge to say, listen, you can do more. You can be more. You can be what God wants you to be. And God will give you the power and the will and the authority in your life to do it. It's somebody that will encourage you and challenge you to live that way and to know that they're living that way. And they'll challenge you to live that way. That's the life of building up. You, you edify in Ephesians chapter 4 when, when Paul's talking about the gifts that he gives to, to the leaders of the church is to equip the saints for ministry. The word equipping is mentoring. It's building up. It's encouraging. It's challenging. It's exhorting them. It's building up, not tearing down. So point number two. That's what Paul, that's what Paul purposed in his life to do. Build up, not tear down. Number three on the list is he will be known for his compassion for others. In verse nine, compassion for others. The false apostles or teachers tend to be self-centered, grasping for power and abusive. People usually mean nothing to them. They're a means to, their, to an end in their lives. The false apostles pointed to the severe letter in verse nine. That's what they're talking about. This severe letter that Paul wrote to the church, Paul said, I, I, I don't wish to seem as if I would terrify you with my letters. That severe letter that I wrote about how you were living, listening to these false teachers and how you needed to turn. His goal was to challenge them to repent, to repent of their sins and turn back to God so that blessings could come in their life. Listen, you need to be around a man, a godly man or a godly woman, that if they see sin in your life, they'll tell you to repent. Repent of it. Turn from it and turn back to God. Because when you do that, you unleash God's blessings in your life. Sin hinders God's blessing in your life. If you're living inside sin, listen, repent. God says repent. Turn from it and turn to Him so that blessings can come in your life. Live your life that way. Be pleasing to God. That's what a man of God will do. That's what a woman of God will do. They will stand for truth. And when they see it in someone's life, they'll challenge you lovingly and compassionately to turn from it and to turn back to God. Because that's truth. And you'll stand on that truth. 
will be known for his compassion for others over and over again. Paul told the Corinthians how much he dearly loved them. He had love for these Corinthians, for the church. The true men of God are marked by compassion. The false apostles are marked by indifference and malice. The true men of God are marked by compassion. They're all about being the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. And they're not the hirelings that are just hired to do a job. They'll lay down their life in compassion and love and mercy. So number three, the mark will be compassion. Number four in our text, we get to the next verse, verse 10. And the fourth one on your list is that he will be known for not trusting in worldly methods, but in God's word alone. Not trusting in worldly methods. The apostles' letters, he says in verse 10, if you look down at your Bible, he says they're weighty and they're strong. That's obvious. There's no denying the power of the Apostle Paul's inspired pen and the clarity and the rationality and the spirituality of his writing. The reason he resonated with fervor and conviction for the truth and for those Christians. His personal presence is the next thing he says in verse 10 was unimpressive and his speech was contemptible. He's talking about what the false teachers are saying about, the, about him and his life and how he presented himself. According to the false prophets, Paul lacked the charisma and the personal charm that commanded respect and loyalty. They were trying to make themselves out to be strong and decisive leaders. And they were trying to make Paul out to be weak and wishy-washy. The false prophets used their polished oratory skills and their slick manipula manipulation to, to sway the people. The true man of God refuses to use fleshly methods. Instead, he preaches the word of God clearly and powerfully so that the people's faith will not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. 1 Corinthians 2, 5 says that. Paul says, my preaching and my teaching, it doesn't rest on who I am. It doesn't rest on what I say. It rests on the power of God. My preaching to you this morning does not rest on the cleverness of my alliteration because I'm not very good at it. It doesn't, it has nothing to do with how I can outline and organize things. It has nothing to do with how I apply or tell you to apply the Bible. It has nothing to do with that. The power to change lives, the power to get your life right, the power to have purpose and meaning and significance and worth in your life, he comes from the Bible and not a man. He comes from God's Word. If you want to live with purpose and power and know how to live the Christian life and make a difference in your family and in your home and in your job and in community, wherever you live, if you want to make a difference, you see follow what the Bible says, not what a man says. And if my goal is to point you to the Bible and to found your life and your influence and everything about your life on God's Word. Because on God's Word is where the truth is. On God's Word is how you can make a difference. And God's Word is how you can live your life. Amen? Amen. God's Word is the truth. God's Word is where you point people to. Not gimmicks. We need gimmicks, we need stuff that we do, but we don't point the power to transform lives to that. The power is in the Word of God. You're here not because, you're here because God wanted you to be here. You're here to hear what God wants you to hear. Not because I'm some special or unique person, but because God wanted you to hear what it is is in his word today. That you can live life with purpose and meaning. And you can have significance, but not in your own self and not in your own power and not in the words of somebody else, but in the words of Jesus Christ. That Jesus loves you and he's given his life for you and he's died for you and he wants purpose and meaning for your life and he wants to pour his grace out into your life if you will turn from your sin and turn to him so he can pour that grace into your life. God wants you to hear that today. That's God's word. That's the power of God's word. A godly man will a godly man will always point people to the word of God and the power of God's word and not to themselves or their outline or their methods, but to God. Number five, verse 11. He says a, a godly man will be known for his integrity. Integrity. What does integrity mean? Verse 11, he says, consider this, 
that what we are in word by letters when absent, we are also indeed when present. Our words match up with our actions. What we say is what we do. The apostles' life was total and consistent. It was authentic. It was real. It was genuine. He was known as being a man of his word. When he told him something, it was true. It was consistent. When he challenged him to live a certain way, it was how he was striving to live his life. When he challenged him with the word of God, he had challenged himself first. By contrast, true men of God, by contrast to the true men of God, false apostles or teachers are often quite different in private from their public image that they project. Lots of people may come to your mind when I make a statement like that. They're different in their private from the public image that they project. There's something different. You can't go around talking and gossiping behind somebody's back and it not eventually affect your ministry and your influence on the world. Just one example. You, are, you, you, you be true to your word and true to what, how you live your life and what you say. And especially when you stand and preach God's word, what you say is what you've already preached to yourself. Trust me, last night when I was preaching this in here to an empty, it was, it was some powerful preaching to a heart, my heart. First, before I say it to you, not that I'm going to get it exactly right and do everything, but it first came to me before it comes to you. Truth. Genuineness, authenticity, integrity in what you say. That's the mark of a true godly man and a godly woman. The last one, number six. This verse is 12 through 18 in your Bible. And I believe Paul makes the point that he will be known, a godly man will be known for pointing people to Jesus. Pointing people to Jesus. You see, what characterized Jesus was his attitude of humility. Didn't Paul tell us in Philippians 2, 5, have this attitude in yourself, which is also in Christ Jesus? Have this same attitude. The attitude of what? The attitude of humility. No one except Jesus portrayed that the greatest or had the most profound effect than Jesus Christ. The second one would probably be the Apostle Paul, his impact on the church. He had this huge impact, winning people to Christ, founding churches, growing up disciples, mentoring young men, challenging the church, teaching and preaching the Apostle Paul's life. But listen to how Paul described himself. Second Corinthians 4, 7, he says that he was a clay pot in that day and time. That was just like a trash can in our day and time. I'm just a clay pot. Just something that is every day common that God is using. He would describe himself this way. Romans chapter 7 verse 24. He described himself as a wretched man. You remember what Romans 7 is about? Wretched man that I am. I want to do this, but I end up doing exactly the opposite. I don't want to do this, and I keep doing it. Wretched man that I am. That's the Apostle Paul. He saw himself like that in great humility. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 8. He says, I'm the very least of all the saints. In 1 Corinthians 15 9, he says, I'm least of all the apostles. In 1 Timothy 1 verse 15, he says, I am the foremost of sinners. He's admitting, I'm not perfect. I don't got it all together. I don't got it all together. I'm, I'm imperfect. This is the life that I have. This is who I really am. And in his humility, he served Christ. In humility, instead of pointing to himself, he would point to Jesus Christ. And Christ was the answer. And Christ had all the solutions. And Christ was the one to follow. He goes on in, the verse, in our text in verse 12, and he talks about how he was unwilling to compare himself with others. He measured himself against a divine standard, and that was Jesus Christ. In verse 13, he said he was, he was willing to minister with the limits that he had been given. He says in that verse, it's apportioned a measure to do what I'm doing. Even Jesus was limited when he was here on this earth. 
He was limited to doing the Father's will. He was limited, Jesus was limited to the timing that God had set. He was limited to the people he was to go to. He was limited to the message. I've come to seek and to save that which was lost. That was the message. Number five, he was limited in his priorities. He was supposed to focus on 12 guys. And they were all fishermen and tax collectors. It wasn't the wealthy, the, the, the religious leaders. It wasn't even the government leaders. It was, this was his priority. Jesus was limited. Paul's saying, I'm limited by what I can do and the influence and the splash that I can make in this world for Jesus. But whatever it is, he was going to point people to Jesus. He was unwilling to take the credit for others' labors. Verses 14 through 16 of our text. In verse 17, he was willing to seek only the Lord's glory. He who boasts, he says, is to boast in the Lord. And he's quoting from Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 24. If you're going to boast about anything, you boast about it in the Lord. That's where Jeremiah says, if some boast in chariots, some boast in things of this world. But as for me, I'm going to boast in the Lord, in Him alone. That's what Paul's saying. That's the focus of his life, was to be willing to seek only the Lord's glory. To continually keep pushing and pointing people to follow Jesus and give your life to Jesus. Follow Him. He He's the leader. It's John the Baptist when he sees Jesus and they say, who, he looks at him and he says, he must increase and I must decrease. It's all about him, guys. Follow him. Verse 18, he was unwilling to pursue anything but eternal glory. What matters whom the Lord commends, that's what he was all about. He was all about the eternal glory. He was all about pointing people to Jesus so that they could know Christ and come to, to go with him and spend all eternity with Jesus in heaven. The true man of God will be recognized by his relationship to Jesus, his impact on the church, his compassion for people, his not trusting in fleshly methods, his integrity, and his continually pointing people to Jesus Christ. That is a true messenger of God. That's a true man of God. And Paul contrasts that to the deceivers that were in the church. So church, you need to know the difference and you need to be vigilant, vigilant, vigilant about serving, vigilant about doing the things that God wants you to do. Pointing people to Jesus. Pointing people to Jesus. I hope I can do this for a long time. I hope one day when I leave, the thing that you will remember about me was it wasn't about him. It was all about telling you to follow Jesus. If you're here today and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, listen. Jesus wants you to surrender to him. Follow him. He wants to bless your life. He wants to, to do and work in you and, and do his will in your life. But he won't do it if you hold back. He won't do it if you hold on to that sin or you hold on to that stuff that you're holding on to, whatever it is. He can't do it. It blocks the blessings. So surrender your life. Give your life and all to Jesus today. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you for your truth. I thank you, Lord, how, how we, can, we can sit here today 2,000 years later and read these passion-filled words of Paul as he's defending his apostleship to this church that he loved and trying to challenge them with what matters most. I just pray that today that you've gotten through to my heart and to every heart that's here about putting what matters most and what's most important in their life first. And that's you. And Lord, I just pray that people today in this place would be, would be pointed to you I pray that the blindness would drop down. I pray that a crack in that fortress would be there today. I pray that there be a way to get through to the stubbornness of hearts, to know you and to believe and trust in you and surrender their life to you so that they can begin the journey of a lifetime. I pray, Lord, if there's somebody here today that needs to repent and turn from their sins, and confess you as Lord, they will do that and they won't hesitate from making that decision for you today. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand with me and sing this decision song? To Jesus 
Star.